Welcome back. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? All three of these men have earned their living through crime, uh, ranging from armed robbery through to drug stealing. All three men were, were known to the police as, as serious, big-time criminals in the Essex East London area. All three men had reputations as being incredibly hard and very sort of tough and uncompromising. I think it's recognised that these men were no angels. They were professional criminals. On December the 6th, they died in a hail of bullets. Was it a contract killing, or did the men know and trust their assassin? It's December the 7th at White House Farm near Rettenden, Essex. A bit cold this morning, Kent. Farmer Peter Theobald and his friend Ken Jiggins set off for work. By that time it was about 8 o'clock uh, and we both jumped in the Land Rover to go over to feed our pheasants. As we've driven down the, the lane towards where we feed the birds, there's uh, a Range Rover parked in the gateway where we needed to go through. We thought it was a bit strange because uh, usually if there's a fisherman who rent our pond going down to the, the, the lake, they will have their own key and they would have gone through the gate and not left the vehicle uh, in the way. So we drove down to the Range Rover, pulled up about 20 yards short, thinking like that would give the people a chance to back out of our way. I got out and walked towards the Range Rover and as I walked towards it, I could see the person sitting in the passenger seat and I could see the driver and I assumed they was asleep. So I went forward and looked right into the driver's side, looked straight at the passenger, there was blood all down his front, the driver was sitting with his head to one side, with blood on his face. Peter! There's two dead bodies in here! I'll call the police! I got out of the Land Rover to have a look for myself, and when I've looked in there, uh, there was also a, a third person in the back seat. There's another one in the back here! Didn't look as though there'd been any kind of... Uh, struggle with the two in the front, they were just sat there and they was, as though they were asleep. The three dead men had long criminal histories. Their leader and best known of the three was 38-year-old Tony Tucker, a feared underworld figure. He was uh, what the police would describe as a, as a top draw criminal. He was um, a, a man who'd amassed a very large amount of money from the importation and distribution of drugs mostly in the Essex East London area in the last couple of years. There are some estimates that say that he may have actually made as much as a million pounds this year alone. That money bought a lavish lifestyle with a £250,000 home in the pretty Essex village of Fobbing. Tucker rubbed shoulders with the rich and famous. He regularly acted as minder to super middleweight boxing champion Nigel Benn and lived a glamorous life in the club scene of the South East. I actually came across Tony Tucker at a couple of clubs and it would be quite obvious when he entered because everyone would sort of rush over and want to shake his hand or say hello or pretend that they knew him perhaps better than they actually did. Uh, it was quite obvious that he had something of reputation amongst them. Tucker also ran a legitimate and lucrative business supplying security to nightclubs all over Essex and East London. He used his influence here to market his drugs. Tucker had connections to the nightclub security industry. He would know an awful lot of bouncers and he'd either use his friendship or he'd bribe people to allow him into nightclubs with large quantities of drugs and then uh, approach dealers within those clubs and sell drugs to them. 
37-year-old Patrick Tate was the most violent of the three murdered men. Tate had built a, a reputation for himself as a very difficult character to deal with, very tough, very quick to use his muscle to settle any sort of dispute. He was a man that you didn't mess around with, and, and he played on that reputation. The owners of this Essex takeaway can testify to that. Unable to supply him with exactly what he wanted, Tate wrecked the restaurant and beat up the staff. But the man who could fly off the handle in a moment was, according to his family, also a loving father, partner and son, whose short temper was heightened by the influence of drugs. Tate was a steroid taker. He was a dedicated bodybuilder. This exclusive footage was shot when the 18 and a half stone six-footer was serving a 14-month jail term in Wandsworth Prison. In jail, he was able to indulge his hobby of bodybuilding. Without the gym, you'd be lost, you know what I mean? There's nothing to do here, you know? and when you're over the gym, you're, you're in a different world, and you forget about prison, you're training, you know what I mean? The third murdered man was 26-year-old Craig Rolfe. He was somebody that appeared to have been recruited by them or become friendly with them, and they used him a lot as a, as a, as a go-between, as a gopher, a driver, um, a general hand. The last sighting of the men's car on the night they were killed was at 6 p.m. when Rolf dropped his girlfriend off at the lakeside shopping center at Thurrock. Detectives believe he then picked up Tate and Tucker and headed north along the A130 towards Chelmsford. This was rush hour in the metallic blue Range Rover, registration F424NPE, would have had to stop traffic as it turned across the main carriageway into the remote bridleway near Rettendon where the killing took place. It could have held you up. Did you see it? What time was it? Did you notice anything unusual that night? The Range Rover was bought just a few weeks before the killing. Police want to trace anyone who's been in it. Have you been a passenger? Or do you know someone who has? The murder probably took place between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. on Wednesday, December the 6th. Both Tate and Tucker had dinner dates at 8 p.m. that night, and despite having mobile phones with them, neither rang to cancel. Police believe the men had used the location before and knew and trusted their killer, a man they believe will kill again. We believe it was a, a meet to further a drugs deal. It's clearly a place that they would... Um, have been told to go to. It's not the sort of place that you would just happen upon. It's not uh, a lane that's very well known to anybody in the area. It is my view that if they thought they were in danger by going down this track, they would have armed themselves. In view of the fact that they haven't armed themselves, it tends to suggest to me that they were meeting a well-trusted friend or associate and did not fear for their own safety. The killer fired eight times. Police think he used a three-shot pump-action 12-bore sawn-off shotgun. It was a clinical killing, the assassin reloading his gun twice, walking around the car to put another shot into Tate and Tucker. The three men would have had no chance to react. It would all have been over in a few seconds. I've tried to figure out in my own mind the sort of person that I'm looking for in this offence. Um, I think that I'm looking for somebody who is cool and calculated and prepared to kill three people at point-blank uh, range without giving it another thought. That takes a, a lot of planning, it takes a lot of nerve, so this man is a, a fearless person, I would suggest. The murder scene is an isolated track not far from White House Farm. It's a favorite location for gun clubs, so gunshots after dark is not unusual. The killer must have visited the area in the days before the murder to plan the killing. Did you see anyone acting suspiciously in the lane in the week before the murders? Perhaps an unfamiliar vehicle parked there. If you have any information which might help detectives, then call them now on 01245 328233. That's 01245. 328233. Alternatively, you can call Crime Stoppers on the usual number, 0800 555 111. 
It's time for another break now. We'll be back in part three asking for your help to catch a fraudster with a love for the sea. What started as a routine traffic patrol was about to take a very different and dramatic turn. A car has been found, a Range Rover, in the Rettenden area near Southwood and Ferris. Um, and inside there were three male bodies, all dead and all with gunshot wounds. Uh, so there's a major investigation on at the moment to try and find, uh, find out what has happened. Why. Um, and it's, it's quite a big thing for Essex, it's, it's very unusual for something like that to be found. Um, and we're on our way down there now. There'll obviously be a lot of forensic evidence to gather. The vehicle will, will no longer be in situ. That'll be taken away um, undercover for further forensic examination. By the time they reach the murder scene, it's already teeming with reporters and photographers anxious to find out what has happened. Which way is the, um, which way is the vehicle going to go when it comes out of here? Probably, uh, yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's going to Woodham, so we're going left. They want a uh, traffic car to stop to a fend off. Oh, mate. Right. Yeah. Give it a nod when it comes out. Yeah. Scenes of crime officers have already carried out an initial inspection of the vehicle and it is towed away for further tests to be carried out on it. Is it normal for them to cover the vehicle up? Yes, it is because it will probably undergo some further forensic examination back at the, the police station. There might well be marks on the glass they might not want the press to see at this stage of proceedings. No number plates on the vehicle. Would that be because the police have taken them off? Don't know. We're, we're here today just to escort the vehicle to nearby police station and just to make sure that nobody tampers with the vehicle and that nobody gets too close to it. But uh, it's not an everyday occurrence for a, a crime as serious as this to be discovered. Something like this would probably only happen once every few months in, in Essex. We're just interested to see if we've got any tax on it, aren't we? Only later did we discover the real reason for the tarpaulin. The bodies of the three men were still inside the car. At most murder scenes, bodies are removed separately, but in this case, the Sockos have advised that the bodies be kept in situ. 